Um, thank you very much, Julian, for that very kind and uh, fulsome introduction. And just a couple of thanks. I'm just thrilled to see so many people here tonight. And I hope I'm going to give you something good to go away with. And just a special thank you to academic colleagues and friends who've, one of them has flown in uh, from around the country who are here to join me. It's always good at these really special occasions to have people who've helped you along the way, and I've had a lot of help along the way. Um, let's get into the meat of the business. Um, I hope I'm going to talk to you a little bit about digital economy uh, tonight, um, but I want to talk about us in the digital economy uh, more than anything. Many of you will not be familiar even with the term digital economy, but of course will be absolutely uh, familiar with what it means in terms of all the gadgets that now dominate our lives uh, every day and, and shape the way we relate to each other and the way that we work. Um, I've entitled my talk very deliberately and, and in some ways quite provocatively, I think, for a number of colleagues who are here tonight. Uh, wired reality is meant to indicate uh, that I think we really are moving into a new world. Um, I think in, in academic terms, we often use uh, the, the word ontology to talk about what reality is, what the world actually is. Uh, I'm not going to get too theoretical on you, to, on you tonight, but in a sense it does mean the nature of the world that we live in. And it's a very controversial thing to argue that that's what digital economy means, and I have a very particular perspective on it. And that's all my intention is tonight, is to hopefully present to you some of that perspective, which I hope for some people will be inspiring in terms of how they see uh, digital economy. So the second part of my title is really about that, living in a networked world. And underlying um, the sentiment of what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is my sense, having studied the uh, internet economy as it originally was from its really early days, uh, that increasingly technology has become too dominant as a perspective on digital economy and there hasn't been enough perspectives, uh, enough emphasis on uh, humans and human interaction and human orientation. And I think this world I'm going to describe is, is a world that is in our own hands. I think our future in the digital economy is very much something that we as individuals and groups of people and communities uh, have a lot of influence and control over. Uh, but I think at the moment we need to raise a lot of consciousness about those possibilities. Uh, so by way of introduction, I just want to say a little bit about where I come from in analysing digital economy. Um, as the Vice-Chancellor said, my, my cognate background is in international relations and international political economy. And for those of you who, who don't know the field of international political economy, it's a very particular area that undertakes macro, what we call macro analysis, in other words, the big picture, really, um, and is focused on change. It actually is, is, a, is a discipline that is interested in understanding uh, change. And it's out of that uh, background that I became a scholar of globalisation as what has been uh, one of the most dominant areas of change in the world that we live in. And, I'm sure you wouldn't believe it, but when I started working on globalisation, everyone said it was a fad, and, and now it's just a part of everyday terminology. So we published our first critical collection in 96, and then people just thought globalisation would come and go, and, and here it is in the media every other day. So uh, it's interesting how these things happen. And out of globalisation, because the internet developments were very much a part of what was changing in globalisation, I developed my work more into media and communications as a focus academically, uh, because that field was really one that allowed us to look at the internet in what you might call a socio-technical way. In other words, looking at the interactions between sociology and, and technology, looking at the social developments as they interact with technology. And, and so what, in a way, my approach to digital economy is very much 
the, based on an understanding of it as mediated dynamics of change. So in other words, I'm interested in what is happening inside the digital economy and I want to understand uh, what the implications of, of the changes that are, are going on for us as individuals and us as communities and particularly in terms of, of the world that we're creating or failing to create. Uh, so I heard a, a, a historian recently quoted as saying with relief that the future is not my field. Uh, to some extent, the future is my field. Uh, and, um, of course, that, that involves some challenges uh, uh, as well as some really exciting prospects. So that's the broad area that I want to kind of draw you into tonight. So I'm going to start a little bit with the macro side of things, and then I'm going to move to the micro side of things, which is about us as individuals and what the digital economy means, and then come back out a little to the macro to end. So the first thing I want to talk about a little bit is, is the position of the UK um, in this uh, world that we're moving into. Uh, because many of you may not be aware that, that statistically the UK is regarded as certainly a leading uh, part of the digital economy, if not in some terms the leading um, uh, country. So the internet economy in, in the UK is argued to be larger per head than in any other country. So, so there's a huge amount at stake for, for the government and for us as individuals in that context. And a recent uh, international report uh, came up with the figure that 60% of leisure time in the UK is spent consuming media of different kinds. And of course, included in that are our mobile phones that we're constantly glued to all the time in various guises. Now, one of the things that that's creating at the policy level, very much in the UK, but also in Europe more widely in the European Union, is this emphasis on innovation, um, which has always been part of economy, of course, but because of the speed and, and, and nature of change in the digital economy, there's now a big steer to focus uh, increasingly on, on how we can generate innovation, how we can sustain it, and in the European context, how we can develop what, what is often termed as an innovation culture. And of course, talking about innovation in the economy and talking about an innovation culture are two quite distinct things. We're all familiar with new forms of technology and new forms of, of innovation that occur in industry and other processes. Uh, but an innovation culture is something quite different and it is distinctive in terms of what the digital economy is and what the roles that we all have in it as producers and consumers. So again, that's something that I'm, I'm hoping some of the points I'm going to raise will shed a little light on for, for, for those of us who are not as familiar with digital economy as I am. The first thing to say about digital economy is that a lot of people think of the internet and the, and the, and the gadgets that we use related uh, to, to the mobile internet and, and other forms of hardware and software that link into that is, is that they're just part of the economy. Whereas what is actually happening is that the economy as a whole is not only transforming uh, at the macro level. So in other words, what the actual, in ontological terms, as I said at the beginning, what, what economic reality is, is, is changing. What production is and what consumption is, what those, what those things mean in our lives and how they happen and who is involved in them. Is, is actually changing in a wholesale way. And uh, of course, that is that is something that's happening in fusion with the industrial economy that we're all very familiar with. And what those changes involve are what we might call new materialities uh, of reality. So what, what is happening is that a lot of the materialities that we're very familiar with in the industrial economy are being replaced 
uh, by new forms and processes that take place in, in what's often termed the virtual environment of the internet. Um, and of course, this is impacting on the kinds of social infrastructures that we have, not just in economic terms, but in relationship to institutions, including universities, of course. So you can think of it in very simple terms as, for instance, the contrast between all the shopping that we do online now and the platforms that we, that we undertake those kinds of activities on versus the physical activity of, of going to the shopping mall, which was very much an icon of industrial modernisation. And of course, it means that digital economy is now something that characterises the differences between countries. China is a very important example as something we don't have a precedent for, being a country that has both hyper-industrialised and is at the forefront of digital economy developments. So we have this hybrid process going on within China, which, is, which we have no models really to understand or assess. And because China tends to be an economy, of course, because of the nature of its uh, government, we know less about in terms of its internal workings than we do other economies. This is going to be one of the big challenges of the next 50 years. And of course, India is another economy, for example, that has really forged ahead in the globalization process in terms of its role in outsourcing, uh, particularly in the ICT sector, and now increasingly as a major player in various aspects of innovation within ICTs. So not surprisingly, India and China are big focal points for both our government and the European Union in terms of our engagements with them, not just academically, of course, but in business terms as well. So if we think about this world that we now live in, um, I've come up with two terms to try to capture uh, this transition the geospatial and the socio-spatial. And the geospatial is that world on the left that we're all really familiar with, that physical world that we move around in every day, the world of offices and university buildings and the natural world around us that we're so lucky to have a lot of around us here in Brighton. Versus the socio-spatial world, which is a, a world that is just as real and just as powerful and increasingly more influential in the lives that we lead, but actually takes place predominantly within virtual spaces. Now, all these virtual spaces are connected to hardware in the end. They're, they're all part of that real geospatial world, but they're very different in their materialities of how we can in, and see what they are and see what's going on. Um, I'm going to say a little bit more about that um, in a minute. Um, but I think there is a huge challenge for us realising that we are moving now across those two worlds and that they have uh, very different forms to them. We might think about them as the physical world versus the virtual world. And two key areas that are very different within the physical and the virtual world are the relationships between time and space. So it is very much digital technology, technologies that have freed us from many of the constraints of time and space, just as many technologies within the industrial era did, notably, of course, the motor car, which still maintains an iconic position, and of course, um, the aeroplane. So this isn't something entirely new, and it's important to look at continuities with industrialization when we look at digital economy developments. But what we've seen with the digital economy is a, a, a real intensification of that transcendence of time and space constraints, whether we're looking at things that are very near to us in our lives or things that are very distant. And what we have to cope with now is the fact that our lives are lived through both of these contexts and that both of these contexts, we move between them seamlessly all the time. 
And one of the problems is that, that they offer us different challenges. So if we think of key areas such as identity and privacy and safety, they operate very differently when we're in the geospatial and when we're in the socio-spatial world. Uh, so I work with a lot of colleagues who do work, for instance, on safety and children in online environments. And of course, it's very easy to teach children lots of things about how to be safe offline, um, but quite a complex operation to teach them how to be safe online uh, when it's possible for their movements to be tracked and, and for people to be anonymous or to take on different identities in lots of different spaces that, that young people are working and moving through. One of the things I want to emphasise is that we're at the beginning of, of the digital age. Uh, we, we can look forward and think that over the next 50 years, what we think of as the digital will transform. So, so if we think how recently we would have thought it very weird to be connected through wireless without us actually seeing the wires and everything, yet now we virtually move around really thinking, why aren't we wired wherever we are, you know? Um, so it, it, it's a real signal of how quickly things can change and how transformative the digital age can be before we've even really caught up with it. And one of the reasons it's really important to recognise that this is, is an era that's just beginning is, is the point that I began with about it being very much in our hands. The, the over-focus on technology tends to feel that we are not in control of this era. Uh, but there are many, many ways in which digital possibilities have opened up potential for innovation, not necessarily in the kind that is meant industrially or by policymakers, but innovations of our own individual kinds and, and community kinds. One of the challenges, I think, in the dawning of this age is, is our capacity to be proactive, to, to, to be proactive people who, who shape it, um, both in our individual lives but also at political and economic levels. And there are, I think, very real dangers that technological imperatives could uh, increasingly uh, push out human imperatives and possibilities. And, and we have to recognise that the machine age of, the, of industrial times could really become an intensified machine age into what we might think of as an intelligent uh, machine age, and what, which, which means that we're harnessing all the power of ICTs uh, to actually mean that we're locked into that machine age uh, in, a, in a far more intense way than we have been uh, before. And again, I'm sure this will speak to most of us who feel that our lives are really steered, often particularly in a work environment, uh, by our, our mobile computers and our phones all the time. One of the ways that it's helpful to think about uh, what is happening in digital economy is, is one of the major areas that is transformative about it in our interests, in the micro sense. And this is something that I've written about for a long time and lots of other scholars in analysing this has have this idea of horizontal versus vertical structures and flows of power. In traditional geospatial environments of the physical world, we're used to vertical structures of power dominating, whereby that vertical sense of people having power over those below them is the predominant way that our societies operate and that our identities within them are formed. What has transformed very much in the digital age is the increase in horizontal flows of power and interactions. Because of the nature of digital technologies, they allow us to communicate directly um, uh, much more than we could before. And importantly, they allow organisations to connect uh, much more effectively. Um, in that way. So we've had lots of uh, disruption 
of vertical structures of power. And of course, the WikiLeaks um, scenario is one that we, we most of us know uh, very well. Uh, but, but there's lots of other everyday disruptions of, of vertical power that go on, particularly in the in civil society and in the NGO sector, and particularly in global movements. Uh, I've been particularly active in the global women's movement and have seen uh, the changes that horizontal communications through the internet and digital economy have enabled in allowing women to work together uh, as individuals and as groups without having to go through the vertical structures. Uh, and that's very interesting in relationship to an innovation culture, not really the one that um, our government and the EU uh, policymakers are talking about most of the time, but the innovation culture that we could see growing from the grassroots and from alternative <coughs> movements and alternative ideas. And there are all sorts of forms, as you know, and they constantly grow and expand from Twitter to blogs and video blogs and all sorts of things that allow people to actually say what they want to say without actually having to go through a local newspaper or a national newspaper and to actually share that in, in, in very extensive ways and to actually build movements um, and processes together. So, so for me, probably this picture of the digital economy remains the most important one in trying to counter the macro perspectives on it, the ones that, the important ones that governments and companies have, and big players like Google, and, and the ones that have shaped very much the digital economy and facilitated lots of things for us. Um, but I think the horizontal force of what's happened in digital economy is, is to some extent too much a missing element of policy when they talk about innovation culture and the potential for the future. And, and, and unfortunately, it's too hidden an element of digital economy because, of course, we do still primarily live in an age where mass media is dominant, where government obviously are one of the major communicators with us at all levels of processes within our societies. And the mass media, to some extent, increasingly shares some of the horizontal. So again, the, the WikiLeaks scenario was very interesting. Some of you uh, may have um, read about the way uh, and, and actually used the Guardian site, the way that the Guardian worked very closely um, with the WikiLeaks people to do uh, a mass media development in a sense of what, what they had begun. Um, and, and that's a very interesting interaction of the vertical and the horizontal. Uh, a lot of my work uh, in uh, practice has been uh, in that horizontal uh, sphere. And as I say, one of the problems is that, that some of that is too hidden. One of the areas that is worth thinking about to do with that, that matrix as well is, is, is the whole area of public and private. I don't have a great deal of time to say too much about that now, um, but one of the disruptions that the digital economy causes is this sense of, of, of where we can define what is public and what is private. And of course, Facebook is one of the uh, most uh, well-known phenomena <laughs> that has uh, facilitated, for good and ill, I'm sure, uh, lots of disruptions of the public and private um, and caused um, concern, in a sense, about whether people are conscious enough about the way that horizontal interactions, particularly as they're facilitated by market actors, may expose people to certain forms of public disclosure or public presence that they really don't want to have. Uh, so one of the things uh, that I've explored a lot in my theoretical work, but also in practice with groups involved in, in internet work, is, is this issue of what the public and private mean in a digital economy. 
uh, and this is important in a macro level, which I'll say a bit more again uh, uh, in a little later. Uh, what does it mean to be a private person in a Facebook age? Are we really conscious enough of our own privacy and are we really controlling it enough or are we actually giving over control of it to other actors, particularly macro actors and particularly actors whose interests are primarily uh, commercial? Uh, and they may, you know, it may be a social phenomenon, but it's a social phenomenon of quite a new kind. So there's lots of things to think about there, but I, I like that diagram in terms of sort of very simply saying what this is all about. And the horizontal idea of us looking to one another as, as equals um, does have some utopian uh, dimensions to it, which many people who've managed to use the internet and use digital communications and processes uh, for, for, for improvements in the world or for greater equality, I think are, are very locked into. One of the, the problems, I think, in, in us um, navigating the, the detail of the vertical versus the horizontal is the way we see the internet, unfortunately. Um, and... I think for most of us are not digital experts. Most of us are not computer programmers. Most of us don't understand uh, software. And increasing numbers of us do, and, and increasing younger digital natives will become familiar with that, those languages. They're really new languages, really, that are shaping the world. But for, for most of us, I think it's true to say that we, we tend to look at the internet in a screen-based way. So uh, it's often said now that, that this stage of the internet is, 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 is a multi-screen stage where we're actually, our lives are, are operating through a whole range of different screens, whether it's laptops or mobile phones or notepads or our, our desktop um, computers. And the trouble with viewing things as a screen is you're not really too interested or perhaps insufficiently interested in what's going on behind the screen. And for scholars like myself who are studying digital economy, we're very much interested in what's going on behind the screen. So it's, the screen is just the interface. It's just the way you enter that world. And uh, once you're in it, then really it's, it, it's the structures and flows and processes and what you can and can't do uh, that become really interesting and challenging. So there's lots of possibilities, but there's lots of challenges as well. Um, and I, I, this little image really is, is, is meant to kind of signal, you know, that when we're shopping online, we are actually, we are entering a commercial world. Uh, when we do anything online, we are actually entering particular social spaces. So I remember a really interesting example when I was uh, teaching at Leicester uh, with uh, my MA students on digital economy. I had a very interesting young woman who was very much a digital native and really at the forefront of, of developments. And, and she was completely a Facebook fan. And this is, this is many years ago. I know we've all caught up with the rules and regulations of Facebook now, but this was in the fairly early days of, of Facebook, really. And uh, she was a very pro-Facebook, and she gave us a presentation on it. And, I, and I, I, I sent the students away to look at the terms and conditions of, of Facebook. And uh, she came back the next week and insisted that even though it wasn't her turn, <laughs> I let her give a presentation to the class where she actually then talked about the evils of Facebook and said she was never going to be on Facebook again. And it, I've never forgotten that moment because it was, an, it was just, I think, a very interesting example of... Uh, and I know my students were very moved by it because, as I say, she was a very, a very pro-digital person. Uh, but she was horrified when she realised that, that you know, Facebook owned all her uh, material and that, that she'd actually entered into some contract that, that she hadn't realised. Uh, and she gave a very powerful presentation about why none of us should be on Facebook. Uh, and I'm sure some of us who are there <laughs> regret it, really, uh, later. So I, I actually think at the moment we're struggling with a screen-based ideology 
where um, uh, the sort of uh, comfort zone that the television has lulled us into over the many years of industrialization is being too rapidly transferred to this multi-screen era we live now. Um, and, and the problem about that is that the television age, as, as most of you know, is a fairly passive uh, age. It's, a, it's, a, it's an age when, in simple terms, we would, we've been delivered with menus, basically, pretty narrow menus that we then uh, are allowed to make certain choices from, but they're very narrow. And the problem with that is that it, 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 it makes us really quite passive. And in digital economy, that's a really problematic area because, as we know, everything is much more intensified. Our opportunities to consume, our opportunities to be present in the digital sphere are vastly expanded beyond that earlier era. And the problem with the digital sphere is it's not a passive sphere. It's a sphere that actually forces you to be very active. And the issue is whether you're active according to uh, Facebook's uh, pretty, you know, not exactly highly sophisticated platform and their terms and conditions, or whether you're active on your own terms and conditions, whether you actually take that uh, possibility for action and really harness it. And I think part of the problem of the age we live in is that the predominant theory of freedom we have is liberal theory. And that's the theory that really actually drives societies like our own and has shaped them very much. But liberal theory really isn't probably doing enough to catch up with the kind of activeness that the digital economy allows us to have, and in fact is, is, is really an imperative. You know, so our whole sense of being citizens now and proactive citizens, um, unless we just want to all be consumers and kind of just take what these platforms deliver, uh, really ask us uh, to be active in a way we've never been before. So I think there's a, there's a lot to be thought about to do with screen ideology. And as I said, I don't think we have to be uh, ICT experts or technology whizzes. I, I'm, I'm not particularly at all, but I'm deeply engaged with what digital developments mean. Um, and when you enter um, the internet, as I've said, a lot of the horizontal processes that go on are, are, have to be found. You have to seek them out. Uh, they're not presented to you with quite the pizzazz that Google and, and Facebook are. Um, but, but they may have riches, which are riches that would actually change uh, people's lives. So uh, I work with, uh, obviously, lots of really exciting colleagues in, in this field, some of whom I agree with them and not agree with them, and some of I agree with some of what they do and not other parts of what they do, and them with me, of course. Um, but scholars like David Gauntlet are, are very, very interesting. David's based at uh, Westminster. And um, he's been working on creativity for quite, quite a long time. Now, it, it's not really creativity in the way that, that our colleagues practice it in the arts faculty here, which is at a very high level in particular crafts and forms of, of creativity. It, it's more at this macro level that, that David's looking at it in a similar way that, that I'm looking at digital economy and, and seeing creativity and the idea of everyday creativity as a route into this proactiveness that I'm talking about. Uh, and there's some really exciting material now coming out uh, that's trying to sensitize us to being a digital citizen. And um, uh, I find David's work really interesting in, in that way. You, you, you can find his website very easily and he's very much a digital native himself and, and has lots of material on there about his work. So I think at the heart of our futures, for me, is, is how much we can and how quickly we can become active 
digital citizens. And of, and, and of course, there's a huge variety of that activity. Uh, I've chosen certain areas of my own practice-based work to be involved in. Um, there's huge choice, much more choice. You know, we don't have the menu. <laughs> Nobody's giving us the menu. We have to come up with our own menu. We have to generate it out of our own lives. And, and I think that's incredibly exciting. That, that's, that's what is already changing the world, even in things like the music industry. We've seen huge change from individuals uh, finding their own creative route in. And, and they're often become part of the mainstream structure at some point. But clearly what they've created is impacted on by the fact that they could come in via their own route. And I think that's just one of many, many examples of, of what is possible. And I think part of finding our way to being more proactive is to recognise that our identities now have become more complex. Um, we have multifaceted identities that represent that geospatial and socio-spatial existence, the hybridity of it and the interactivity of it. And um, if we look at the idea of located identity, that's the more traditional form of identity that we have that has some place-based elements to it. Uh, the state is, of course, crucial uh, for our identity because without our passport, without papers, we literally don't exist once we move out of our state. And of course, many of us can't move out of states uh, because we don't, we don't have those kind of paperwork. So that, that, that still remains one of the most important forms of vertical power that resides in the state and that actually defines our identity. But then, of course, there's the broader area of the communities that we actually live in and operate in and, and move across. In globalisation, we began to have more cross-border elements to our identity. They might come through production. We might be migrant workers. They might come through consumption in terms of consuming goods uh, that are made um, uh, across the world and have travelled uh, great distances. And it might be all sorts of forms of other identity formation that, because of globalisation, have been possible for us. It's opened up the world in, 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 in completely different ways. And then I think now we have this virtual network uh, connectivity um, that is another element of our identity. And I, and I think that all those three areas now are very influential in the way we think about ourselves um, in the world and the way that we uh, can configure ourselves differently. Uh, and and uh, they're fundamental to thinking about how we might change the world uh, and ourselves w within it. They involve different forms of association and different senses of belonging. So some of you will know there's been lots of debate about you know, are online communities, real communities, what kind of community? The issue is that they are a form of association and, and there will be different elements to that association, different strengths and weaknesses. Uh, they may be time sensitive, so often online communities are very intense at certain moments and then they fade away, they may come back again. I'm involved in some communities online that I've been involved with in one way or another for 15 years or so. So that's probably as important, in some ways maybe more important, than my located identity. And, and, I, and I think that the existence of our globalised identities and our virtual identities are an important way of thinking about citizenship beyond the state. Uh, which has been a, a long-held a long theme, particularly in, in liberal debate. Um, the virtual is often the way that politically um, a lot of people reach beyond uh, their state. And, of course, one of the powerful ways we saw that was in the Arab Spring uh, protests recently. Of course, importantly for many of us... Um, these aspects of identity impact on the way we think about empowerment and inequality as well. 
because that's another way that the world has become more complex, that actually issues of how we can empower ourselves and groups now operate across all of those areas. And aspects of inequality operate across all of those areas. So just because we have the digital economy, it doesn't mean we now need to move to just looking at inequality there. To some extent, that will be related to other aspects of inequality that we're more familiar with, including our located dimensions of inequality. Um, so I've worked on inequalities through, throughout my um, academic life, and uh, I have tended to focus more on virtual uh, inequalities in recent times, uh, but they constantly take me back to inequality issues that impact on these other two areas. So I want to move from that just to looking at a little bit about the macro aspects of digital economy and to say a bit about um, the academic sphere and what is happening there. That There's so much that could be said on this, but I just wanted to flag a, a few things uh, in coming back to this macro perspective. Most of us know that science and technology have throughout industrialization been the predominant forms of knowledge building and the most important paradigms. And to some extent, there's an intensification of that in digital economy. But there are also disruptions that are, that are happening within digital economy. Part of it is to do with the all-encompassing nature of virtual environments, of the socio-spatial environment. Because in traditional geospatial settings, we are more used to there being boundaries between different spheres of our life. I mentioned the public and private earlier, which is a whole big area that we could look at in a lecture on its own. But if we think about the sphere of politics, the market, social arenas, civil society, traditionally in geospatial analysis, those have been seen as being, to some extent, obviously interrelated, but bounded sections. One of the major new things about the nature of the digital economy is that those boundaries don't mean the same and to some extent don't exist in the same way within the virtual sphere. When we can be multitasking online, maybe working on Facebook while we're doing a bit of uh, paid work, uh, maybe looking at a political site at the same way, maybe visiting a a pop star's uh, website. We can, we can actually be moving across all of those different boundaries, including the public and private, virtually instantaneously. So that's part of my argument, that we're moving into a new reality and that there's something ontological going on here. There are shifts in the way the world is actually formed. Um, and this is impacting very strongly on the way that acad academia works because while science and technology still remain the dominant forms of knowledge and, and, and the most highly regarded and funded, importantly, forms of knowledge, there's now a real drive to connect them with other academic areas and to become much more interdisciplinary uh, because we need the creative skills of, of the kinds of areas that are, are very central to our arts faculty here, but also the wider areas of social science and humanities to actually help science and technology navigate this new world and, and transform it. Now, in a sense, a lot of these interrelationships are in their quite early stages and, and aspects of them are are quite clunky in some ways now. The research councils are, are really driving a lot of this. Obviously, the government has a lot of investment in it. But how you genuinely bring those um, areas together is one of the challenges, uh, including for institutions like our own. And I'm, I'm very ambitious for Brighton to be at the forefront of, of those developments, as it has been in other areas throughout its history. Uh, and I think we have huge opportunities in this university because, uh, as some of you may know, we have tremendous um, areas of community work that we do, both practice-based and theoretical. 
uh, much more than many, many universities. And if you go back to that horizontal drawing of mine, of course, that, that community orientation is a huge strength for us in trying to navigate those challenges, because one of the ways we need to do it is through communities. So one of the projects I've been involved with is the Monmouthpedia project down in Wales, uh, which was the world's first wiki town. And uh, they've now wired the town. And there's all sorts of work going on down there which are trying to engage uh, the community. Uh, and it's amazing what innovation is coming out of that, not from a traditional science and technology route at all. And, and, and lots more of this experimentation is, is bound to go on. So I'm, I'm very excited about the potential for that here at Brighton. This is, a, this is a word cloud from feedback that the Technology Strategy Board got for its Connected Digital Economy catapult. Um, a number of you here will be familiar with the catapults. The Technology Strategy Board uh, operates slightly to the side of the government, but it is basically the UK government's innovation arm. And uh, it has introduced a whole series of catapults um, which are basically innovation hubs. Uh, the Connected Digital Economy catapult is the one that I'm particularly engaged with because it works with creative and digital economy. It's in the process of establishing now um, and uh, we'll be hearing, I think, a lot more about it in the future. But again, these, these uh, catapults have, have not featured much in the mainstream media, uh, but quite a bit of government funding is going into them. And they are actually uh, centres of um, really working towards this new future that I'm talking about. Another one of the catapults is Future Cities, which again, some of you may be interested uh, to look up. That's well underway now as well, and Brighton is engaged with that. Now, one of the interesting things about these catapults is uh, their methodology, their approach, which is very much, I think, um, going to be one of the shapers in, in digital economy. And one of the emphases there is on this idea of consortia. That's the word that's used, consortia. And the research councils and other entities use different terminologies of that kind. And what that means is that they're trying to bring together different groups of people who didn't in the past come together or, or didn't come together um, in different forms as, well, as fluidly and innovatively as, as they want to produce now. And that includes large-scale companies, very large-scale companies who obviously remain big drivers in the digital economy but with what they call SMEs, so small and medium-sized enterprises. And a small enterprise can just be one person in a room uh, in the digital economy, That's, and they can be someone who becomes a multimillionaire. I've had the privilege to work with a few, few through their years of, of doing that. Um, uh, and also, of course, academia. So, so one of the things that's happening with these hubs is that they're really focal points for bringing those consortia together to work in new ways. Uh, and uh, in, in this one, as I say, it's the one that's really foregrounding uh, the creative economy. So it's the one I'm most engaged with. Is this a new economy? Is, is in a sense, I think, the question that's going to be around for quite, for quite some time. People like me argue that it is in some ways... Um, the government and other institutions, the people who are making aspects of this new world, you know, have their own arguments uh, about it. There are, there are an enormous range of perspectives on it. It isn't a case of just a utopian and a negative view of it. There are, within the utopian type views, there are a huge diversity of views. Within the sort of innovation area, there are lots of different perspectives on... What, what this new economy means. So it, it's a very rich terrain, really, that, that as I say, you, you have to navigate in, in very particular ways. I mean, in a way, that kind of relationship that I've, I've mapped there very simply, it, it's still the relationship we're working with. You know, that policy is, in a sense, driving the research, the applications and the use come out of it, the benefits and challenges are there, and then the whole thing just keeps going. So in that sense, 
in a way, the economy has always operated that way from a, from a policy point of view. One of the things that I think is driving uh, the establishment of the catapults and Europe's Horizon 2020 innovation steer is the sense that in a globalised world, with innovation moving so quickly and major new players, I mean, China will increasingly be a, a major new player, but as I say, India and, and other parts of the world too, the speed at which innovation moves means that we have to become more fleet of foot. So there are a couple of terms that are used frequently. One is the capacity to pivot, which I think we will be increasingly working with our students with. And, and that means the capacity to see an opportunity and to harness it and to work with it. The Technology Strategy Board, if you look at its website, you'll see that it's, it's kind of culture in funding is to facilitate a lot of pivoting with small players in a consortia mode. So they fund a lot of small and medium-sized enterprises. As I say, often individual people working with an academic on a particular form of, of innovation. And the idea is that they can move quickly, get the money to people quickly. And, and as I say, it, it does go to individuals. It's based on an idea you put forward and they have calls all the time. So I think that question will, will not go away very easily. I just wanted to bring you back to some of sort of what's happening in the policy level at the, at the macro scale. Um, I've headed this title Big Data and Everything because that's where we've gone. Um, we were talking about the Internet of Things until recently. This is a very new report, as you'll see, a global report that's come out. Now it's the Internet of Everything. <laughs> But back to my dawning of a new age, you know, that, that point about more than 99% of things in the physical world are not yet connected to the internet. It tells you that, that there's a real vision here uh, that governments have. And, and I'm being quite simplistic now, but the internet of things, which is what I was dealing with till we had the internet of everything, I'm still trying to get my head around that a bit. So it's the IOE now, um, is, is the idea that everything is intelligently connected and that there are feedback loops for everything. So it is a bit of a minority report type world, whereas I'm driving into Brighton, you know, there's this thing telling me there's something's happened here and automatically directs me where to go elsewhere, tells me which car park's full up, tells me this, that, and it, you know. And so I can react to it, yeah? So we can be walking down the street and information can be fed to us. Um, so it, it does have a bit of a, a science fiction type feel to it. And I, and I think these macro debates are the debates that are not very horizontal and, and that a lot of us are not very engaged in. And, that, and, that, and that's what concerns me to some extent and why I work with this macro type work, really, because particularly for my students, it's really important. They think that policy is a bit boring, but I actually think we live in an era where policy isn't boring at all and, and the kinds of things it's trying to envisage for us are really a wholesale change of, of, of the world we live in and, and how we think about what life is and, and our environments and the way we move around them. And, of course, it's all really sold in this very kind of... Um, sort of given techno-deterministic kind of way that, of course, it will make things better and that we'll be living this smart life. Uh, but, of course, those of us who feel a bit trapped by some technologies now know that that's, that's too simplistic a picture and that we might have a lot of other views of it. So um, I'm not suggesting for one moment that you want to go away and read these reports, but I, I wanted to flag up to you that... that there is a lot of policy material being produced. Nestor's manifesto for the creative economy is quite interesting. That's come out recently, and one of our colleagues here at Brighton has been involved in that. Um, and that's a kind of a creative reaction uh, to, to what's going on with the digital economy. So um, these are just a few points about uh, the sort of the good and the bad and the whatever about digital economy. I mean, the fact of the matter is that if we're pretty passive in what's being dealt, served up to us, um, we might end up with some strange worlds where we're being fed and consuming just more and more and more via the digital economy. 
Uh, but there are other aspects uh, to it. And I'm not going to go through these all uh, individually. I just wanted you just to see some of them and, and the different ways of thinking about it. But as you know, I mean, there's this whole area of monetization, which certainly the TSB talks about a lot, particularly to do with creative uh, industries and how we monetize content. You know, this is a big theme. Um, you know, whereas versus the whole idea of sharing stuff, which, are, which a lot of us want to do. And of course, bound up there is the whole debate about intellectual property and copyright and how we manage uh, these processes more effectively. Um, and, and a theme that's come up throughout internet studies has been this idea of enclosure. If some of you remember the old, you know, the real enclosure movement where they enclosed the fields, there's people actually trying to relate it to that, you know, that are we talking about freedom or, or are we talking about enclosure? But I think the last one is quite important, you know, when we're navigating this environment, you know, whose who's constraints and whose possibilities are we looking at? I think we're stuck at the moment with a mix of living analogue and digital lives, you know, and that's my mix of the geospatial and the socio-spatial. We kind of have to live in a world where we put one foot in front of another and we're, we're real, at the same time as we're, we're living digital lives where we're in a virtual kind of time-space environment that is, in, a, in many ways, much more intense than the actual analogue life we're living. And I think some of us do feel that tension in our lives. And I wonder sometimes whether academic work is really paying enough attention to that, and certainly where the politics is itself. Linked to the final points I've finished, this is my final slide. You see the iconic building here. Um, my, my final comments are just to say a bit about where I think universities sit in this. I've already said a bit about <laughs> academic disciplines and how there are a lot of challenges about, in a sense, breaking down the boundaries between them and, and, and them finding new ways of working together. But I think universities are very challenged by this horizontal versus vertical environment because traditionally universities are pretty vertical in, the, in their mode. You know, they've delivered knowledge up to people. Now, I'm very privileged now to work in a university that's very practice orientated and particularly our arts faculty. So there's lots of work that goes on in universities that, that, that isn't in that vertical frame at all. Um, but I think that universities, if they want to be drivers rather than followers in this, in this new digital economy, I think they, I've, I've argued here already at Brighton that I think we do need to change more to being communities of knowledge and practice, much more than universities really, where we are actually able to pivot and work together as students and staff in different ways on research and on learning and where we actually don't divide, in a sense, the learning from different forms of practice, but we find really innovative ways of being able to do live, real-world projects and actually have students assessed as part of that. Now, Brighton, as, as some other universities, have innovated in those areas of, already, but I think I'm talking about something bigger than that. I'm talking about an institution itself being defined in that mode. And, and, of course, in that sense, I am emphasising that horizontal mode. So, so my kind of view of a digital economy is one that really harnesses that horizontality and, and the creativity and the interconnection that, that is offered to us now. Um, but I think that lots of academic theory also needs to refresh itself to assist us in, in understanding that world and, and how to navigate it ourselves to make it what we want it to be. Thank you.